Okay, now we're back. So go ahead and uh, we're talking about levels of ideology. Yeah, well, you want to speak into that some more. I got distracted right at that point. I apologize for that. <laughs> no problem. <clears throat> I think that uh, it, it is important to uh, address ideologies, and it is important, too, to, to me, like I was saying, to have uh, secularism be a, a big value that uh, that we as a, as a society has. Because it's it's us being able to be amiable with all the religions that allows everybody to be to be you know at the highest form of well being. Yeah, let me ask a question about that. Is that that's self evident to you and me? I mean, I'm right with you, Damon, and I hope that you know that. I, I, except that from an us against them mentality, that kind of prior, if you think about it in terms of, of uh, individual development, it really is kind of concrete operations. What does concrete operations look like at a worldview level? Well, what it looks like is that concretely, my gods, my people, we look alike. We're against anybody that doesn't look like us. And yeah. so when you start talking about more of a universalistic ethic, or worldview that's inclusive, you and I can see the value in that. And I don't think either of you and I would exclude anybody necessarily. That means people that are offensive us believers, <laughs> yeah, except that it's not reciprocal. They'll be happy to rid you of, from uh, the planet that's for the true. sake of Allah or God or whoever it is like that. And so what do we do about that is that this embrace that you're aspiring to, and me too, Damien, uh, is actually seen as a... Uh, 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 heresy that needs to be eradicated. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I want to show them that, that there is a different way. Like I said, I, I I'm not super happy with uh with with you know some of the people that are atheist leaders. Even like I don't know if yeah. you know that David Silverman <clears throat> just recently got fired as a president American atheist for doing uh sexual abuse stuff and for That's doing right. fraud. Or, or some That's kind right. of financial stuff. Sorry so, to hear that. Yeah. <clears throat> I didn't know that. I don't follow that, but I'm oh, well, really but, sorry to hear that. But, and then, so there, then there's a, a scientist, uh, Lawrence Cross, which is a, an out atheist, and he just got taken down for, yeah, I guess, years of sexual stuff. I thought he was yeah. a great, kind guy. It's, like, yeah. disgusting to me. So, I, I mean, yeah. and there, there's a few people that are really credible, and but I want to be one of those, a voice going, yeah, no, we need to be ethical. That, yeah. that has to be where it starts. It's not... Yeah. It, it, I don't like the us versus them because I feel like it's all us. We are them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, how do we get other people to see that? I would th say the first thing I think is that um, is to get them to reason. Because I think that a lot of people, they're emotional. They're running off their eyes. They see it and they react immediately with almost no thought at all, without no care, no filter. And I'm trying to, to not just for myself, but for others, teach people how to filter. How I want to ask you a question. I, if, if you think of like uh, just the development in Western history, that up to the time of, let's just say, Descartes, uh, kind of the onset of what's called the Enlightenment, the predominant worldview uh, uh, philosophically was like, you know, Thomas Aquinas, etc. It was, it was uh, you know, uh, kind of scripture-based uh, philosophy and it's quite wonderfully articulated and so on like that and then all of a sudden you have Descartes and the the, the movement towards empiricism and, and rationalism coming in so it becomes, begins to be kind of the dominant at least intellectual philosophy but if you look at the United States is that the modal level of intellectual development in the United States is concrete operations most people in the United States are not able to think abstractly um, on a day-to-day -day basis. They'll have moments, some people don't have moments, but they don't operate there most of the time. And so if you look at a bell-shaped curve, the biggest, the middle part of that bell-shaped curve is people that are not able to understand or practice rationality. And so what do we do in, the, in light of that fact? How do we usher people into that next developmental level? I've been doing that for 10 years <laughs> on, on, on Facebook because, I, in other words, I have um, uh, like about almost 3,000 people that are, um, you know, friends on LinkedIn, but I have about 100,000 followers on Facebook. That's wonderful. That's great to hear. So, uh, yeah, so, but I, because, uh, Facebook is, um, there are some people that are intellectuals, but that's not the norm. The norm is people that are not intellectuals. But that's actually helped me a lot because it's forced me to have to, how do we get to these people? I mean, they, we. I know philosophy is good, but you can't get them to read it, so they won't care. How do I make it simple but still usable? And yeah, that's why I, I've, been, I've been inventing um, tools to do that. Like, um, to me, um, I teach people um, about how to believe properly. So belief etiquette. 
So that you should have um, reasoned belief acquisitions. Whatever comes in, you should evaluate. Just as a yes. stand, not just atheism, yes. anything. Yes. Just as standards of, of how to reason. Because people say critical thinking, but how do you do that? So this, this yes. is easy. So it's a it's a belief etiquette. So it starts off yes. with three things. It starts off with reason, belief acquisitions, good belief maintenance, and then honest belief relinquishment. If we do that to everything that we we think, we're willing to do that to everything we think. It will improve critical thinking right away in just a simple kind of a package. You've piqued my interest with that. I'm particularly interested in the third one: honest belief relinquishment. relinquishment. Could, yeah, the, 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 could we, you say a word about that? I'm interested. Yeah, so because I feel like on, a lot of times that we're presented with ideas, we don't like them, but we see it's true, or we don't want to do, to a, a change to them, even if we see it's true. This is cognitive dissonance or denial, and and there's other things too, motivational forces that you know uh, of why we don't want to do it, but but the, the, it's it's an uncomfortableness. So, but yeah. it's honestly when you're when you feel that feeling then an honest thinker should go then that more reason that i should actually do it because i'm feeling this feeling it's like a warning sign like a red flag Bing! wow i'm feeling super uncomfortable with this idea <laughs> i'm running from it then i need to be honest at that point that i'm not i need to truly expose it and see what it is and then be willing to remove it and that, that to me, it's a hard thing because uh, like, I, I realized I had to be kind, even though people were mean. And it was hard at first because I'm like, it's not fair. But I realized, that, yeah, but this is not about fair and unfair. This is yeah. about making a difference or not making a difference. Yeah. <laughs> I liked how you introduced earlier, and I'm thinking of right now as I'm listening to you, to adopt a uh, counselor's perspective. <clears throat> And uh, I can still remember uh, my first counseling class. This is 40 years ago. And I came home from my first day in class, and I told my mother-in-law, I said, uh, Verna, I said, I, I discovered today that I don't know how to listen. <clears throat> and her response to me was, that's right, Bobby, you don't listen to anybody. <laughs> Which wasn't exactly what I was intending, because in her view, listening meant doing what I say. That wasn't really what I was saying. She wasn't wrong about that. I probably didn't do what she wanted me to do. But, but to learn how to, to, to relinquish ego enough to create a space where you can be with somebody who not only doesn't see things the way, see things the way that you do, but also would see you as being fundamentally flawed. Yes. This is what the truisms from developmental psychology is. That which is developmentally less complex does not see that which is developmentally more complex as more complex, it actually sees it as less complex. <laughs> and so to have to deal with that requires a fairly light touch with your own ego, because people will see you not only as being mistaken, but actually kind of stupid. Oh, and in fact, in fact well, I have that all the time. I yeah. have people on Facebook that think that I don't know philosophy, when yeah. I have philosophy teachers that are like uh, impressed you know, so, so the, 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 the difference is, like you said, the scholars hear that, like, like I have a thing I call the hammer of truth, that all ideas have to go through because it's truth navigation. I don't debunk things. I navigate. Is it true? So we find out together. And I use ontology, the what of things or, or the thingness of the things. Yeah. I want to, uh, to qualify to, to, uh, to get a good. And then the next is epistemology. How do you know that? Yeah. What, what is yeah. it to know that? And yeah. then the axiology, which is the value. Why yeah. is what you're presenting valuable? Why is it quality evidence? Why is that yeah. beneficial to life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny when you, when you think about it is that we don't get any education in this. In fact, it gets relegated to ph philosophy departments, yeah. and they're on the wane at this point, uh, is that what would it be? I've, I've wondered about this uh, in recent years because of my interest in mindfulness practice. There's been this thought... Why don't why aren't children taught how to self regulate? They should whatever. be. Well, they should. Why aren't they taught to self regulate? And they're really not taught how to do that. But you could equally ask why why can't we have a curriculum from the very beginning that and have one that's developmentally sensitive that encourages what you're talking about, Damien? I, 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 I want that. Oh, I absolutely. Why, I, I can't. I, there was always the sense for me. It's funny. I remember this. My wife at the time when I was in graduate school. She, uh, one time she came into the office, I was at a psychotherapy office, and next to me was a fellow student in graduate school. She had a psychotherapy office, and my wife Tammy came into my office, and she says, you know, it's funny, 
as I look at your books and I look at Mary's books, Mary was the other therapist, in fact, Mary and I led groups together. And so she said, you know, you go in Mary's office and she's got a book on every single disorder, like how to treat, you know, generalized anxiety right, disorder, yeah. how to treat post-traumatic stress disorder, as those kinds of things. And Tammy said, I come in your office, Bob, and what I see are books like The History of Western Thought. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that my, my, my thought then, and it's, it's probably at least this true now, probably more so, is if, if one can learn how to think, then the, the stuff, the specifics will work themselves out. And yet I can study specifics, uh, you know, applications till the cows come home. And if my epistemology, if my, if, if my understanding, if my critical thinking is impaired, it won't matter what I put in there. It will all be, it will all, it'll all be hamstrung by that. So I've always remembered that image. It's like, yeah, we look at very different books. <laughs> True. And, and then also I realized that in the, looking at different books is the different biases that we hold. And so it's important to me not, not just um, um, to understand other people's biases, but understand mine. Right. Yeah. Well, I, had a, I had a cultural anthropology instructor in graduate school, and I liked him a lot. I almost did my doctoral dissertation uh, in cultural anthropology, you know, I was going to psychology graduate school, so I was so taken by anthropology. It really relates to what we're talking about right now. And I remember Chuck, uh, Chuck Kraft, he was a great professor. He looked at me one day, he says, Bob, there's two kinds of people. He says, there's lumpers and there's splitters. And he says, you're a lumper. <laughs> <laughs> and if you talk about a bias, is I tend to see forests. And I'm less interested in the individual trees, and that's a limitation for sure. Is it really a limitation? But what I'm good at, or what I care about, are synthesizing the big, the big picture things. And so, what we're talking about is of great interest to me. Oh, and yeah. when the conversation, when the conversation, I notice this myself. When the conversation moves to more and more specificity, my interest just tends to wane. Well, that's a limitation. It's a temperamental thing for me, and I have to work at that cognitively to kind of stay present. But you know, that's uh, that's a bias, if ever there were. It's like it's like a lens through which I see everything. Well, yeah. Well, I, my personal feeling is that we're always doing that. There's no, there's no words. I mean is. I think that we're, we constantly live in, our, in, in what we feel is the I or us or the, 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 we see it as some kind of an avatar, like the whole being, but yeah. that's not yeah. true. I mean, you, you can see this error even when they do tests where they, they put you with fake legs, but you're looking at them and they scratch them, they touch your leg and they get you to think it's the same thing and then they stab the fake leg and you go nuts. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never heard of that experiment. It makes complete sense to me. Yeah. I'll give you this. I'll give you an example of, of, of how this works for me, this side of stabbing of legs, is that I meditate every morning, and I've done this for almost 40 years, I'm coming up on 40 years of meditating in the mornings, and uh, uh, it's a very simple practice, it's non-sectarian, it doesn't require any kind of a philosophical religious belief, in fact, it's just radically phenomenological, right. whatever I experience is what I experience, I don't impose any categories on it, but I do, I do approach it with curiosity, so this morning, like most mornings, part of what I do is I do what uh, in Buddhism is referred to as insight practice, yeah. it's as simple as this, it's what I do, is I, 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 I take five minutes of my whole meditation, and I just notice what crosses the, uh, the field of my mind. So it can be uh, it's a lot of thoughts, because I think a lot. You do too. Sometimes it's a, uh, uh, a sensation, uh, but typically it's a thought. And I'll just make a note of it, like, and I'll just label it. I'll go thinking, thinking, like I'm going to see Damien today, thinking, thinking. And sometimes I'll even get more specific. I'll label it thinking, future. I'll, I'll say, is it past, present, or future? And then also, is it positive, mixed, or negative in terms of unpleasant? Yeah. And so if I'm thinking of seeing Damien today, Thinking future positive. That would be a lot, but I'll just do that. What it does is it teaches you over 40 years to just start noticing that, that this, this self that I, what you just talked about, you know, this, this, uh, this avatar is so partial because there's some capacity to observe that doing what it's doing. I do, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can actually do that sometimes while I'm talking to people. Yeah. Good I, I can like, good like analyze yeah. the, what I'm okay. doing as I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really key to a successful therapy, since that's very close to the work I've done for the better part of four decades, is that, uh, first of all, the therapist, he or she needs to be, have the capacity to develop what psychoanalysts call the observing ego, so that you can observe yourself. Right. Ego is just self, yeah. or I, if you can observe that. But the goal is, is not just for the therapist to do that. The goal is to help the client to do that. Clients will come in in all kinds of distress, that's right. you or me, if I can help my client begin to develop an observing ego, 
Uh, that serves them to be able to step back and do that. That's over half the battle won in therapy. In fact, Damien and I have had so many clients over the years that have said to me at the end of a course of therapy, we meet for six months and they go, thank you, Bob, I feel so much better. The irony is I still have the symptoms that I had at least some measure of them when it came in, but I have a different relationship to them. Yeah. And so really what you're doing is you're, you're teaching an attitude or a posture towards your day-to-day -day life as much as erasing things that you don't like. Yeah, like narrative therapy is what you're talking about, yeah. kind of like yeah. right? yeah. Edit, yeah. editing your self-script. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Because I know that's what I feel like that I'm doing too with people that are believers. They, I get them to see they don't really believe. They never yeah. really have often. Yeah. They yeah. accepted. Yeah. Someone told them they didn't have. In other words, yeah. belief, if I were to convince you right now that I have a million dollar car, I would take a lot to convince you of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, because of, you, I, of my financial status and whatever you already know okay. about. So the, the yeah. thought that I would have that, I would take a lot of convincing. So yeah. at that, and, and, if, and if I could convince you, you could truly say you believe. Yeah, and, and and in a rational sense, not yeah. just a blind acceptance. Yeah. And so that's yeah. what I try to do is navigate with them. Like when people say, "Well, how do you know there's no God?" and I just go, "What is a God?" That's an ontology question, and I'm not asking for a definition like something you get at. But if you say you know a thing yeah. and you've experienced yeah. it, you should be able to explain it. Yeah. This is the problem yeah. with people that believe in God. But every person's experience can't be different. Or not so different that it's contradictory about the same being, this God term everyone keeps using. I've got a question for you. It just came up as I was listening to you. At the very end of his life, uh, uh, the psychiatrist Carl Jung, he was the student, the prize student of Sigmund Freud, for uh -huh. those that don't know. Carl Jung was being interviewed by the BBC uh, he, uh, on his property in, in a, uh, Switzerland, right there uh, uh, off Lake Zurich. And uh, they're walking along, and, and, and the interviewer asks him, he says, Dr. Jung, uh, he says, you grew up in a Lutheran family. Your father was a Lutheran pastor. Mm -hmm. In fact, Jung had seven uncles. All of his uncles were Lutheran pastors. Wow. So you got this crazy convergence <laughs> of heavy-duty Protestantism there. And so the, the interviewer asks uh, Carl Jung, he says, uh, and you spent your whole career. In fact, his, his divorce from uh, Freud was over religion, over spirituality. Mm -hmm. Freud would have nothing to do with where Jung was going. So the interviewer says, you spent your whole career studying the intersection of psychology and religion. So I want to ask you a question, Dr. Jung. Do you believe in God? And there's this pregnant pause, and Jung says, I don't believe in God. I know God. And I've, I've thought it, I have a lot of respect for that answer, but I want, to, I want to check this out with you, is that if we were to inspect Jung's phenomenology, his experience, what he means by I know God, I think that you're going to be sitting right here, you with you and me right now, and be completely comfortable. I mean, there's, what yeah. he's talking about is God. Is a, it's an experience that he has. He's he's not comfortable. It's not a thing of intellectual assent. It's like he doesn't believe in God. You know, like, I have no need for that hypothesis kind of thing. Right. But he has an experience that relates to uh, transcendence and beauty and creativity and all of that. And I'm assuming that that's what he's asserting. Well, yeah, but I, 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 I believe in awe, transcendence, wonder. Yeah. I believe in all the things, even like the... To me, that the word spiritual doesn't have any meaning because it's just a to me a misidentification of other things that are naturalistic. It's like looking at the I've had people tell me they look at a baby's smile, then that's evidence of God, the wonder in the world. And I said, so when a baby frowns, is that hell? Is that is that the devil? I mean, yeah. your logic has to be consistent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that for me, uh, so 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 I would ask him first: is what does he mean by God? Yeah. And my guess, he would say awe and transcendence. And, so and then I would say, okay, I, I, yeah. I can agree yeah. that there's awe and transcendence. But yeah. Yeah. So, like I yeah. said, so that's what I mean by ontology. I always yeah. want to find out the thingness yeah. of the thing you're talking about. Yeah. Because of yeah. t two reasons. One, because I don't want to straw man somebody. I don't want to you know, yeah. say they believe something that they actually don't because right. I, right. my own misunderstanding of how yeah. they're using words. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, when I started graduate school, I started in September of 1979. I'm coming up in 40 years ago. And I, it was at the end of my Christian flirtation. Yeah. <laughs> and I was entering a Christian seminary, a conservative Christian seminary. And the very first paper I wrote in September of 1979, I, uh, uh, I called it Trek. 
And uh, what I wrote then, and I was reading a book called A Critical Faith. It was a philosophical book on faith, not dissimilar from what we're talking about. And it was rooted in Wittgenstein, mm -hmm. um, um, which was very appealing to me. I remember writing a paper is that I will no longer, it was really a confession of, of where I was, I will no longer make assertions about something that is not in my experience, which is not to say that my experience encompasses everything. But one thing I'm not going to do is, is try to fake myself out or deceive myself or pressure myself into believing anything. And in the context I was in, that included God talk, certainly included any kind of assertion of afterlife, heaven or hell. And it's, and you know, it's amazing to me, David, it's 40 years later, and you may be uncomfortable with the way that I assert this, I don't mean any offense, oh, my, I'm spirituality, not, I'm not offended. my spirituality or whatever we want to call that, and I'm with you, if we break that out, I use spirituality as a convention, I even use religion as a word, as a convention, but it really speaks to experience, but what's amazing is that 40 years ago, I threw all of that out, and I never took it back again, I don't believe in any of that. And then I have my experience. If you want to know what I experience when I'm drumming with yeah. my jazz quintet, I'll share something that's probably what some people experience when they look at a baby's smile or whatever. Oh, yeah. I don't need to assert that this is there for proof of God. In fact, it's a nonsense yeah. a conclusion as far as I'm concerned. But you know what's interesting, Damien, in 40 years since then, it has not vitiated. It's not, it's not taken away the, uh, uh, the vitality of my life. I feel... I feel as vital or more so at age 63 than I did all those years ago at age 23, which is trippy. And I was taking out what at that point was seen as the core value. If you take God out of the equation, you're just basically fucked. Well, that's not been the case. <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> well, I know a lot of people tell me, how can I be uh, moral without a God? I'm like, I'm more moral now than I've ever been in my entire life. What yeah, are you talking yeah. about? I actually care yeah. about people that hate me. I never did right. that before. I was, right. you're right. going to burn in hell, you know. Yeah, 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 now I just yeah, go, yeah. I want compassion for you, you, you know. There's, you know, there's another book that came out when I was in graduate school. It was by Jim Fowler. He was a professor at, 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 at Georgia at that point. It was called Stages of Faith. And he wrote a book that's very much in sync with other developmental writers, like Piaget's The Big Name in Cognitive Development, which you know of. Uh, Lawrence Kohlberg at Harvard was doing oh, yeah. in moral development. Yeah, I talk and about him a lot. <laughs> yeah, along came James Fowler. He wrote this book, Stages of Faith, and it was it was an early it was an early book. It's, it still is a seminal book for me, and it got me into reading uh, the writings of Ken Wilber over the last thirty or forty years, who looks at everything developmentally. And the fact is, is that I can I can believe in I'm going to use this term I can believe in God, but I'm using it loosely. So mm. hang with me. I'm not using it in a way that uh, I can believe in God and I, I can want to kill your ass because you don't believe in my God. I can believe in God and that God would be the God that supports my uh, uh, my ambitions as a businessman, as a CEO. I can believe in God and that begins to be, that means I take care of nature. I can believe in God and that means that I take care of the whole planet. In other words, what I mean by that in terms of What's the worldview that supports it? I can use the same language and uh, and mean all of those things. It's it's like if the example I give is if, if when my daughter Amanda was little, let's say about three, and she comes home and she says, "Daddy, I think I've mastered addition and subtraction," and I use that as an opportunity, Damien, to say, "That's really cool, Amanda. While we're on that topic, can I introduce you to algebra? X plus Y equals Z." Yeah. Amanda would not look have looked at me and gone. Hey, Daddy, I don't understand that. That's really cool. Someday I'll understand that. That's not what Amanda would have done. She would have looked at me and said, Dad, you're flipping crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so depending on whatever level, Amanda knows math as a third as a third oh, grader. Yes. Bob knows math as a freshman in high school or whatever like that. And so it's just different levels, it seems like to me. And so you can speak, I think, you can speak to somebody like me who's, I, if people ask me, I feel like that my spirituality is highly robust. But I mean it probably not much different than the way that you're talking about moments of awe or wonder or beauty or whatever. That's what I mean by that. And you wouldn't know that unless you asked me. Right. People, Lawrence Kohlberg would go to people and he'd say, he'd look at their behaviors. And, and he, what, he, what he discovered is that you can't tell if Bob and Damien violate the law and break a law. You can't make a moral judgment without interviewing Bob and Damien. So Damien breaks the law and Bob breaks the law. But you ask Bob, why did I break the law? And I say, because I wanted that shit. I wanted to, I, I stole some stuff because I wanted it. Okay. That would be what Cobra called pre-conventional morality. Conventional morality, which is just conventions of law. Right. So you don't do that. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm more stage six. 
Yeah, well, and we interview we interview Damien, and Damien says, "Yeah, I stole some stuff. I did it to save my wife's life." And uh, so would Mother Teresa, so would Nelson Mandela, so would anybody that has any kind of deep moral character. You can't, you don't equate Bob's morality with Damien's. I agree. And you can't know that unless you interview them. And so well, it's the well, same right, thing around this conversation about about uh, uh, belief and religion and spirituality. I can't know what somebody needs. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable most of the time using the word God because I know what that translates to. I live in Orange County. When people use that word, I just, I'm not comfortable using it because I do not refer to what they're talking about. In a conversation with you, I'd probably be more comfortable because I don't think that we're talking at, at cross purposes with each other. No. And I might use it, and it's almost like wink, wink, or in italics or whatever. And it's just shorthand. I'm also fine dispensing with it. The language doesn't damn matter at this level. It doesn't matter. Well, well, I, well, it can I, matter a lot. It can <laughs> matter a lot, though, if I'm a true believer. I'll kill your ass if you, if you, if you say you don't want to hear me talk about God. So it's... Well, yeah, and that to me should be a immediate thing that, that should we should have a brief relinquishment and go. Why do I feel such toxicness? Yeah, yeah, even yeah. even if I didn't want to relinquish the belief, you should relinquish the desire that you should have to hurt anyone that challenges yeah. your belief. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, but yeah. I, I'm not offended by people that believe. I mean, I, like I said, I have no no problem. I, I I don't like sports, any sports really. And but people get over the moon about football, and I'm like, who cares? Really, <laughs> seriously. I'm uh, not far from you on that either, brother. <laughs> so it's like, okay, you know. But 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 in do they have the, do people have the right to use that as a way to do their life? They yeah. do. I think it's ridiculous. I wouldn't do that. I see them yeah. paint their house the color, the car the color. I mean, uh, you make me think of something with the football analogy. You know, uh, Jung was very influenced by Rudolf Otto, who was an early philosopher in the nineteenth, uh, uh, early twentieth century, and his he wrote a book called The Idea of the Holy. And in that book, he he posited this term that Jung picked up on. He called he called what we're talking about in terms of wonder and beauty, he called it numinous experience. And so Jung picked up on this, and now I think we're getting closer to the experiential or the phenomenological, yeah. which is, if I think I can, I, 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 I believe that football, for example, is for many people their chief portal into numinous experience. And how could you possibly judge that? I get off on music the way that some people get off on, on football, and that's why. Yeah, I'm more music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's in common there is this idea of the holy, and by that, Rudolf Otto was really talking about, he's talking about experience. He's not, he's not saying, I experienced something at football, therefore that proves God's existence. No, that's ridiculous. What I do is I experience something quite wonderful, full of uh, awe at a football game, and that, that makes me in common with you, Damien, because you get off on music the way that I get off on football. Right. And so it gives us a common language, and I think an entry point into looking at that. I think people get very concretized about that owing to their level of cognitive and moral development, and they get down to, if you don't like my football team, then you suck. Well, that's, that's a concretization that's really problematic. But I, you know, my son-in-law loves football the way that I love music, and when, with, on a good day, on a good day when we get together and we talk about football, I'll just listen to him as if this is, this is what he enjoys. Why wouldn't I host a place for that? On another day, I might share with him some music that means something to me, and I and I believe that he's open to that. Different languages, but there's a respect there. It's not concretized into my team or my my musical group or whatever. Well, that's more healthy way to be in general. Yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> and that's I why I, so. what I try to do in the atheist movement is I feel yeah. like if we say we're open minded, then yeah. we should be yeah. a little bit more open minded. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying just to um to you know religious ideas, but to interacting with people that are not atheists in a yeah. way that is still yeah. friendly, yeah, totally, the way we totally would treat an atheist. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, i got to go in just a minute, no, Damien, no but I want to say this. I want to say this. I really respect your, I'm going to use this word, I really respect your spirit. And I hope you know what I mean by I that. Know, that's fine. <laughs> I'm not talking about some cosmic entity. It's just, it's like the vitality, the form, the care, the compassion that moves through you. And I really, I really wish for, uh, 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 for the work that you're doing, have every confidence, it will continue to go. I think that the human, I think we're so connected to one another, the way that you talked about Africa, and I think that you're appealing to that, and I, and I do believe that there's, I, I do believe that there's forward movement in terms of developing more and more complexity, and that complexity is going to include, uh, one of the, uh, one of the authors in, in intelligence theory says the sign of intelligence is the capacity to adopt 
increasing perspectives. Mm. So first person perspective, I. Mm. Second per perspective, uh, me against you. Third person perspective, we look at things objectively. Fourth per per person perspective, we actually look at our looking at things objectively. So we're able to criticize our so-called objectivity. Fifth person, six, there's no end to that. And so if increasing intelligence is the capacity to, to see from, from more and more perspectives, I think what you're bringing to the atheistic discourse is increasing perspective in the ways that we talked about today yes. uh, earlier before we met. And I really bless you to that, Demon. You guys, you had my total respect. I'd come back here in a second and continue the conversation. i got to go today. No, no problem. I'm moving. But I, it's really cool to connect with you, brother. I appreciate really you. Can you um, promote your, um, the book that you did and a little bit about what you did at the end there so that people can know? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put links and stuff also, but yeah, thank you. Uh, you can link to my website. I've got a I've got a, a, a CD that I uh, published in December. A lot of my focus, and it's not irrelevant to what we're talking about. Now that you mention it, a lot of my focus is on forgiveness, uh, including self forgiveness. And uh, in order to, in order for me to forgive you. I can only do that if I can take your perspective on why you might have done something to hurt me. So right away you're moving into social perspective taking. Right. If I ask you to forgive me, it only makes sense to me if I really adopt your perspective in terms of how I hurt you. you see, I agree. Said, I and the, the, the third piece of this work, and I'll get to the book in just a second, the third piece of this work is in order to forgive myself, I have to feel what it was like to hurt you, what it felt like to you, and also provide context for why I did it. Otherwise, I'm stuck with I'm just a fuck up and there's no hope for me. And so working with, with, with forgiveness, this is a psychological perspective on forgiveness, but I'm really interested in helping people, especially in addiction, forgive ourselves for the stuff that we've done in and around addiction. In order to do that, you can just as easily say that's an epistemological exercise. Oh, it is. It has, it has, it has life-giving uh, uh, results in it, it seems like to me. So the book I'm writing right now, I'm going to finish it in the summer. It's not yet done. I was hoping to get it done um, uh, about three months ago. I felt very ill, so I'm just coming back to life right now. And uh, the book is called Unshaming, and the subtitle of it is, is Self-Compassion, uh, as daily practice. The thought being is that this way of expanding perspectives that we're talking about, I'm applying it to compassion, compassion towards you, compassion towards myself, compassion towards others. And really, it's, it's, it's an exercise in expanding that. I'm applying it specifically to forgiveness. And most of the book will be addressing those that have experienced severe addiction, because what's in common is that we're all stuck with a lot of shame. And if you don't find some way to heal the shame, uh, it's, it's the number one trigger for relapse for addicts is uh, shame is the most stressful human emotion. You're guaranteed to relapse as an addict in recovery if you don't wrestle with this. And I think in the context of our conversation today, it's a way of really grounding forgiveness, which has been given over to the theologians for years and years. It's a way of grounding it in the personal, in the naturalistic. And I'm just interested in teaching skills. I'm actually most interested in practicing skills. <laughs> personally. Well, I, I, I think you do. And you also do it with a lot of joy and happiness. And I think that that is something that that is uh, um, when it comes to, you know, emotional intelligence, that alone has a big impact. I, yeah. I, I think that, that we have given over to this this society where we're all in these little boxes by ourselves and we forget the human connection and how important it is yeah. to smile. I'm so gratified, I'm so gratified Damon, because you just ooze it. You know, in the Buddhist tradition, they talk, talk about transmission of mind. In psychology, we call it emotional contagion, but you can't help but catch your compassion, Damien, from the moment we began talking today. It's Thank really you. gratifying. Can we please talk before three or four years passes the next time? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Blessings to you. I Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. You take care. All right. Bye bye for now.